The Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwantedly. Hello, and welcome. That poem by Edward Thomas will, I feel sure, be familiar to some of you. But for myself, well, let's say it evokes a very particular occasion. A story so bizarre and so horrendous, I, I still find it difficult to decide whether it actually happened or not. I've called it Blind Man's Bluff. <laughs> but to begin at the beginning, then. I was on my way to visit some friends in a remote part of the West Country. The train was certainly no express, but we were jogging along quite nicely through the lovely Cornish countryside when suddenly we braked and stopped. An unscheduled stop at, no, hardly a station even, at its best a country halt, so insignificant that it was not even considered worthy of a name board. The window was already lowered to its full. I looked out on a single small shack, which obviously served as ticket and parcel office combined. But no activity there, or for that matter, anywhere else. Discarded and rusting milk churns, a mongrel dog panting in the sun, the drone of bees, and far off over the fields, a glimpse of a church tower. But no life, no apparent reason for what seemed a simply endless delay, until, at the very moment when I'd all but decided to investigate the reason, we began to pull away. It was then I saw him. Wait, I say, in the name of God, wait! A man rushing through the entrance along the platform towards the now fast-moving train, rushing so heedlessly that it seemed he actually intended to throw himself under the very wheel. Wait! Instinctively and probably against my better judgment, I opened the compartment door, called out, offered a hand, and finally managed to haul him aboard. But it wasn't until I'd subsided into my seat directly opposite my rescued companion that I realized how truly foolhardy we had both been. The man was blind. Quite blind. I know you are truly kind to risk yourself like that. Truly kind. Oh, no, the least I could do. Anyone would have done the same. Oh, they wouldn't. You take it from me, they wouldn't. What? Not anyone, not most, neither. Most would have stood and watched and maybe even hoped for the worst. What? How about that? Eh? The worst were you surely not suggesting. The missed foot in, the sudden topple or screeching the brakes, and then they all had climbed out to see. My God, to fill their putrid eyeballs. By God, the thing. Under the wheels, by God. I know, you see. By God, how I know. His knuckles were white about the stick. Gnarled white knuckles about the white, peeling paint of his blind man's stick. He wore a long, old-fashioned raincoat, reached quite down to his ankles. In spite of the stifling heat, he'd buttoned it up tight around his throat and a black beret pulled down almost to his eyebrows. But most of all, the spectacles, so deep and black, they seemed like like the sockets of the dead, fathomless, with only the reflection of my own curiosity staring back at me, my own reflection, and the sudden and uncomfortable conviction that I, I was being watched watched and assessed, inexorably assessed. Oh, don't think I don't know why they wish it. I know fine why, all right. I beg your pardon, my dear. Misfortune, calamity. It gives them this feeling of power, you see. It gives them the feeling of being one up all the time, of being superior all the time. Oh, but surely the majority of us must be allowed some feeling of compassion. Compassion, he says. <laughs> oh, well, I, I certainly never intended to suggest that we're all alike. And foolish to presume. Still, you did offer a helping hand at risk of life yeah. and limb. I'll grant you that. But smoke, then, if you must. Why? 
Well, you damn well going to light up around you. How did you know that I wanted a cigarette? Perception. <laughs> There's a toughy nose word for you, in it. but bang on target, all right. Yeah. Get done with it, then. Oh, thanks. Perception. It's the gift God gives us specials, you see, oh. to make up for the things he's taken away. God. Or the devil. Or whatever. Will you smoke, too? No. There's no good looking put out. Never could abide the damn thing. Oh, look, if you'd rather, I didn't. I didn't I see did. that, did I? Suggested it in the first place, didn't I? Yeah. But kind of you to ask. Kind of you to offer. Mm. Perception. No sight. None. Never have done. Oh, I, I am sorry. But smell, touch. Read your mind like a book and no mistake. <laughs> so don't ever get round to thinking different. Mm. No, I'm, well, I'm sorry for that. Not wanting to say that, just by way of protecting myself, you see. Sure. Our times don't help, of course. But, but most on account of of him. Of him? Boy, con. Con be name. Con be nature, eh? Never told him to his face, of course. It would have been the end of me to tell it to his face. The blind man's knuckles tightened about the handle of his stick again. But a sudden tautness about the shoulders, too. A, a feeling of violence so suppressed, so pent, I... I hesitated to ask the next question, but there was no need. Again, he anticipated me. <laughs> Read you like a book. Uh, but I told you that once already, and I... Yes, yes, yes. Calm. <laughs> no, think about him anymore. Not a thing to be thought about, you see. Your friend, then? No, 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 no friend. Never a friend. Oh, oh. Time passing and all begins to wonder if he wasn't sent. Mm -hmm. A means, maybe, a means of getting me on back. Oh, re revenge? People, world, the way it was decided for me. Uh, happy once before, Con. Mother, home. Just a small farm worker's cottage. Only home I'd ever known. Familiar to me, you see. Familiar. Familiar as the back of this hand. Important, that. Knowing it's every corner, every stair. The way every stick of furniture was arranged. And her never changing anything around. Give you a feeling of security I couldn't have found nowhere else. She gave me that. My mother gave me that. I, I can see what it must have meant to you. You can see. She made for it mine. Worked up at the big house, not a mansion exactly, but in a way she described it as me, yours makes no difference. Hard work, bad pay, long hours. Again, the uh, ruddy power of the strong or the weak in it. But at least the stinking pittance they allowed kept the thatch over our heads. A sacrifice I was glad to make. Mm. I never did get over her death. Bad enough sitting by the side of the bed and watching somebody dying. But when all you got to go by is the feel the pulse, the listen to their breathing. Huh? Hard, that. Mm. Well, well, what did you do after? First off, seemed mm. no answer. Bit she managed to say, put on the side, well, soon gone in it. Mm. Then one day I, I get this idea, almost as though it meant me to get it. 
Not a damn sound and it seemed at the time. Oh? Mm. Well, there's this still her old room standing empty in there. Oh, yes, a lodger, you mean. And why not, I think? Still plenty of harvest labour being taken on up at the estate, all crying out for a place to lay their heads. And me with no barn loft neither. A fair share of home comforts besides. So, so I put this... I puts this card stuck up in the post office window, don't I? And, and I waits. I waits. But not for too long. Convoy saw to that. <laughs> home from home, he has a ruddy gall to call it. This is my mother's room. Yeah, we still don't make it a suite at the Waldorf, do it? Yeah. Junk. You what? never see such junk. Please be careful. Oh, not to worry. Can always have it written in the lease, can't we? Some kind of inventory. Hmm? Uh, did you ever get round to your actual inventory, Pops? Hmm? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, well, there's <laughs> one little item we won't have to be worrying our heads about. Please, I... In the name of God, let's have this window open. The old ruddy place stinks of mothballs. Oh, you could make some changes. Oh. The room would be yours, so you, you've been tight to make some changes. Yeah, there'll be some changes, all right. If you think the rent too high, we could discuss... I'd like the asking price can wait. Uh, but uh, there would be changes, yes. Changes, all right. I see. <laughs> well, love of God, you didn't honestly think I'd be moving in and just taking your old lady's place, did you? Did you, Pops? Taken over the nurse companion bit just where she left off. Oh. <laughs> if it's a white stick and Alsatian dog kit you're after, no. you should have tried getting it straight from the start. As far as my handicap goes. Well then, I think I'm self sufficient. <laughs> oh, sure you are. I noticed that. The way you groped yourself across that landing just now. It's eh? <laughs> been some time since my mother's death. Uh, well, some time. Yeah. How about the way you tumbled across that chair the minute we get through the door? Hey, just a, a touch of the old circus act for my benefit, I suppose. When she was ill, there was this nurse uh, rearranged some of the furniture uh, in view of the <laughs> special circumstances, you understand? Yeah, well, I understand, Pops. The $64 question is, do you? Oh, um, sorry. Dumb as well as blind, eh? Well, I'm asking you, Pops, if you finally got round to persuading me to move into this rat-ridden garret, do you honestly know what you'd be letting yourself in for? Eh? Pot luck at the best and at the worst. Uh, you're making it sound like... like some kind of threat. Change, Pops. <laughs> but it all comes down to that, in the end. But you still agreed to take him? Not at first. But the weeks passed. There were no other offers. Oh. They took the card from the post office window. The people up at the big house were getting pressing. Threats, eviction, legal action. Only roots I had, you see. Mm. No choice. So Khan moved in? Oh, <laughs> he moved in all right. Yeah, and... Uh... I did me best for him. Mm. At first, I... I was even glad, just for the sound of another voice uh, about the place. One, well, uh, natural, isn't it? Sure. The past can be good, but it's funny how eager we all are just to be alive in the present, of any kind of present. And it didn't work out then, huh? He took over completely. Not just his own room. Completely. His friends from the estate up drinking all the hours God made. No notion about paying the rent. And, and then, early one morning, yeah, my mother's things, clothes, photographs, the bric-a-brac of a lifetime, really. A pathetic pyre at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> you ruddy what stink pops that's all you got going here well then 
Oh, blind as a rotten mole, maybe, but can't you smell the stench of her eye? Eh? Oh. Enough to drive the starlings off the trees, in it? In it, though, eh? Stink and pass and a maggot ridden old biddy's garbage. That's all we've got here. You, you no right, Carl. No right? Whose bleeding nostrils have they been getting up every hour of the day and night, eh? Look, space to expand, you see, Pops. That's what Con needs. I'm never going to get it with this ragbag of mildew cluttering up the place now, was he? You could have asked. <laughs> oh, go on. So it's asking terms we're after now, is it? Yes, sir, no, sir. Three bags full, sir, now, is it? If you just ask first, I could have moved them, couldn't I? Somewhere out of your way. So look at it this way, my dear old mummy. Convoy's saving you all that extra trouble, isn't he? Hey? <laughs> I'll tell you something funny, though. A couple of weeks back, our damn well ghost putting himself out trying to sell the stuff. You tried to sell my mother's... Well, of course! That shark of a scrap dealer the other side of the village. You had no right. Oh, back to rights again, are we? No! Now, go easy, Molly. Oh, unless you'd like to join the pyre, that is. Mm. Oh, oh, right, old scarecrow, you make of it. Fancy you guy folks a bit early then this year, eh, Pops? If they were hers, damn you. Yes, so now they're hers again, ain't they? Ashes to ashes, all that garbage, eh? You should be hanging out the flags, Molly. Really, you should. Oh, doing you a favour, convoy, yes? I mean, it's say better than settling for a feast day for them moths now, ain't it? Uh, and what about them tarty little cherubs up there, ruddy mm. green with envy when Mumsy gets all this nice new drag through the post? Why, eh? Con? Why? <laughs> oh, kicks. Pleasure. Yeah. You haven't got a clue in there what I'm getting at, have you? Something you're never going to get round to, Molly. Oh, like tonight, for instance, uh, me and my mates, regular old booze up uh, my place, Pops, round about eight. Make yourself a bit scarcish, hmm? Uh, you will do that, won't you, Molly, with Con doing the asking? Always depend on blind old Molly when it's Con doing the asking? <laughs> oh, the fire's nearly out, nothing left to save. Oh, you could always try spitting into the wind, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and yet you you did nothing I, I could have gone to the police should have gone to the police I see that now but, but when you independent on the strength and decisions of others for a whole lifetime there comes a time when you need so desperately to feel the power of Self-possession. The ability to act. I... I found a thing to do. Winter was coming. The cottage was fitted for gas. I just got Con a gas fire over his bedroom. Very sensitive to cold was Con. It burned all hours of the day and night. And sometimes... Sometimes... He even let it burn while he slept. So? One night, I, I simply turned it off. Oh, you mean you, you went into his room and turned it off? Oh, no, no. The mains of the downstairs mains. Well, then? But well. then, when the flames had been extinguished, I turned it on again. I blanketed the crack beneath his door. Uh -huh. Stood there a long time. Listening to the hiss of the gas as it escaped into the room. Con sleep and this drunken stupor become deeper, ever deeper. Till I decide did it add enough, sufficient to me purpose. You mean you you gassed him, you you murdered him. Well that that would have been a kind of revenge, but no too, too simple. I I I hated him. But there's a need beyond hate. He was quite unconscious when I went into him, as deep unconscious as if he were under anaesthetic. Now, underneath the cottage, we had a cellar. In the old times, it, it had been used for storing apples, vegetables, and now it was quite empty. The only entrance was through a trap door, Set into the flags of the kitchen floor, 
but long, long hidden by a big chest used for storing firewood. I, I pulled the chest aside. <coughs> Open the trap. <coughs> Lord, oh, body. And, uh, the dank smell of damp, the sc scurry of a rat. And you, you left him there? In the... uh, not at once, no. Uh, one more thing to do, you see. To give him a taste of the affliction he'd mocked and made fun of over all these long months. I returned to me. Mother's neat front parlor. Her work basket was always on a small window table just where I'd left it. A long steel bodkin. The stout thread just right. I returned to the cellar and there. There. In the eternal dark. I sewed up his eyes. Oh, stitched. By stitch, neatly, methodically, upper lid to lower. I sewed up his eyes, and then I left him there. What happened when the effects of the gas wore off? Oh, it allowed for that. It was to be the final irony, my final irony. Where... Where am I? Where... It's not my room. Light. Light, damn you. Light. There isn't any light. It's all dark. My eyes. My magician. Eyes. Tight closed. It. Stuck. My final irony, my final triumph, in the deep, dank, dark. He'd search for the door, he'd search unseen, screaming with the searing pain of his sewed-up eyes, groping, panicking round the damp, lichen-covered walls, searching, ever searching for the door that would let him out, out, to the light, to the help he'd always taken for granted. Not knowing, not comprehending that there there was no door. That the only way out was not in the walls, but through the trap door, not three feet above his head. A trap door, securely bolted, but weighed down by the heavy oak chest. I left that night. Then I never went back. <laughs> They'd be bound to miss him. I, I mean, up at the estate. Oh, for a few days they'd miss him, but he was only a traveling casual labor. They come and went at will. For a few days they'd miss him, then they'd forget. He was only worth forgetting. The train had stopped at a small halt. The blind man pulled himself to his feet. I opened the door and helped him down onto the deserted platform. For a single brief moment, he seemed to study me, and then he raised the opaque blackness of his glasses, and there seemed to be a smile in the milk-white clouded eyes, the ghost of a smile. Then he turned and pulled that dirty raincoat even closer about him, and tapped his way towards the exit. The tap-tap of his stick mingling with the bird song. We pulled away into that green, bright world of trees and fields beyond. Thank you.
Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello, welcome. This story, which I've called Soul Music, involved me purely by chance. Due to some slight technical failure, the non-stop flight I'd been booked on for filming commitments in Rome was diverted to Paris. And there in the refreshment lounge at Orly Airport, I met up again with Marianne. I spotted her several minutes before she saw me, but the recognition was as immediate as if the intervening years had never been. The same cool, poised awareness, even in that overcrowded, bustling setting. A kind of inner apartness. It would be difficult to describe. It made the frustrations of the flight, even the possibility of an overnight stop, only too worthwhile. The fact that her husband, the international violinist, David Clementis, was bound to be traveling with her, <laughs> in music circles they had long been nicknamed the Inseparables, offered the opportunity of a, of a double treat. Oh, my dear Vincent, it's sweet of you to say so, but an overnight stop. What about that dreadful panic at the other end? Oh, mercy. I can just picture it, some hot-blooded Italian director tearing at his hair, foaming at the mouth, threatening <laughs> death and destruction in all directions if you don't turn up on the next flight. Oh, you've got it all wrong, Maria. As a matter of fact, I took the precaution of giving myself a couple of days' leeway. Besides, from what I can gather, your hot-blooded Italian happens to be an alcoholic German who can't tell night from day <laughs> and has been bucketing with rain for weeks in Rome. By the time they get around to my scenes, they could manage several remakes of War and Peace. <laughs> Some cream? <laughs> Thank you. Well, then, out with it. How's the maestro? Oh, uh, oh, David's. Fine. Well, more to the point, where's the maestro? Well, let's face it, the old crowd always referred to the two of you as the inseparables. The inseparables? Oh, yes. Yes, they did, didn't they? Now, don't tell me. You've got him lurking underneath the table. Stradivarius tuned and at the ready. Well, what's it to be, romance or a touch of ochichonia? <laughs> well, David came on ahead, uh, an earlier flight. Oh, well, no, no, nothing mysterious. A party business agents, an impresario. Well, you know the world. Besides, he's never appeared in this particular hall before, and in violin circles it's got a reputation as a dead house. He suddenly got a bit jittery about the acoustics. Typical David. Huh? Well, always the perfectionist. Yes. Yes, he was, wasn't he? He could tune up at the bottom of a mine shaft and still charm the birds off the trees. Yes, he could, couldn't he? Marianne, you all right? Yeah, well, I'm fine. I'm just a bit tired, but I'm fine. Global Air, I regret to announce the cancellation of their flight 108 to Rome, uh, caused by a technical failure beyond their control. Oh, I knew it. The damned wing has gone and fallen off. Again. What, your flight? Oh, yes, the inevitable dead duck. Passengers are requested to report to the inquiry desk mm. for details of overnight accommodation and alternative bookings for the continuation of their journey. Well, oh, that settles it, doesn't it? Well, what could be nicer? A night on the town in gay Paris, all courtesy of good old Global Air. To begin with, you can wangle me a ticket for the maestro's concert, even if it does mean swinging from one of the chandeliers. Oh, but no, I... No, 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 I insist, and afterwards I'll come backstage, whisk him away from the backslappers, and carry the pair of you off to a secret little bistro I've been saving in Montmartre. Food before decor. And just the three of us. Oh, but surely, if you've got an, an early morning flight to catch... Marianne, on. is anything the matter? It's, it's almost as though you'd rather I stayed well clear. No, no, it, it, it's, it's nothing really. Nothing in the world. It's... Oh, it's really wonderful seeing you again. You think the same will go for David? David? Well, of, of course. Why should it be otherwise? My ticket for the concert was waiting for me at the box office, as promised. 
The attendant handed it across coolly, no, almost contemptuously. I'd expected some kind of covering note from either Marianne or David, but there was none. I passed through the heavy velvet curtains and stood at the back of the circle. There was no usher to examine my ticket, but then there seemed little need. At a generous estimate, I reckon, the whole house could have been moved forward and still barely filled the front three rows. Their mild enthusiasm proved premature, sufficient to say the performance was a travesty. The adverse notices completely justified. The bored restlessness of those who had ignored them and made the effort was unmistakable and totally vindicated. But it wasn't until the interval, grateful for my oversized cognac in the crush bar, that I tried to grasp the cause, the reason for what I'd just witnessed. I settled for one word, contempt. Contempt on the part of the soloist. It summed up his attitude and performance exactly. Even visually, the violinist at the center of this indifference was a grotesque of the David Clementus I remembered. The soloist whose charm and superlative talent had won hearts and critical acclaim in in every major concert hall in the world. A veritable travesty of the immaculate, assured Clementus, who, whose famous profile even now stared out of the display cases that lined the walls. Contempt, not only for that fast, diminishing audience, but for himself, too. But most of all, contempt for that supreme talent that he had nurtured and that they had adulated for so long. But why? In God's name, why? I must have spoken the thought, because suddenly I was aware of Marianne standing beside me, but not the Marianne of the airport. Now she was making no attempt to hide the hurt, the need within her. I'd hoped you might not come that they might have found you a place on an earlier flight. But now that you have... uh, Do you think I might have a cognac, too? Oh, but of course. Encore and cognac. Monsieur. How long? What, like this? Mm. A year or so after our marriage. In the early days, it seemed our love had made his talent flourish. But it wasn't until the pact had been signed and sealed, so to speak, that... I began to notice the change. But what could have changed him? Why? No, let me ask the question. Now, before before I came along, what would you have said was David's one love? The all-consuming passion, the... Well, the reason for his very existence. What a strange way to put it. The reason for his very existence. Well, I suppose... No, 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 don't suppose. Admit it. All right. His music. His only love. It had possessed him from the very beginning, exclusively, uncompromisingly. He had no life beyond the rehearsal room or the concert platform. The demands made by this God-given talent was all that he'd known until we met and loved. And I taught him to share my world, other interests, other people, other places... And therefore, I displaced the total dedication, the exclusiveness of this talent. I broke the absolute stranglehold of whatever power had possessed him before. Possessed? Why why do you use the word possessed? It's a strong word, isn't it? Yes. In the Dark Ages, they applied it to witches and warlocks and burned them at the stake, didn't they? Mm. You know, it's a word we hardly ever use now. We prefer to skirt the issue. But the talent David had possessed him as surely and as completely as any demon. The only difference was, in his case, there could be no exorcist. None. God knows we tried. 
But the talent had exclusive rights, you see. It possessed him from within, his very soul. And when I'm around, as long as I'm around, it destroys him from within and leaves him... Well, the, the broken doll that you saw standing there tonight. You know, Marianne, the ancient Egyptians believed that the soul was a very real, substantial thing that it had an actual physical location, just like any other organ, the heart, the liver, the spleen. They tried to locate it, to preserve it, to sanctify and deify it in their Coptic jars. And a couple of thousand years on, and were only too anxious to deny its very existence. <laughs> but it's there, all right. In David's case, it's in his hands. The soul talent is locked in his two hands... In the fingers that, through his music, can create a heaven or a hell. Not only for himself, but for anyone who dares to interfere with it or displace it. I tried, but I failed. Failed? But you've done so much for him. How could you have failed? Well, David admits it, too. Just now you witnessed his public admission. As surely as any warlock suffering from the tortures of the Inquisition, waiting for the fires of hell to be lit and the agonies of hell to begin. But if what you say is true... Well, I know it to be. That's why I'm leaving him, Vincent. Leaving him? Don't you understand? I have no choice. I can't watch the doll dance. Not once, but over and over again. Open to the scorn and contempt of anyone who chooses to pay the price of admission. I can't afford to pay the price of admission any more. You'd desert him to this force? It's his only chance. It's a fair exchange. My misery for the price of his salvation. Well, I... I'd better get out No, 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 don't go back. You needn't. He doesn't know you're here. And if he did? I know he'd not expect it. But of course I'd damn well expect it, my love. A straightforward case of rally round the flag, isn't it, Vincent, old buddy? Oh, you know, David, but... <laughs> Mark you, the ralliers are lying a bit thin on the ground this season, but, but then that's only to be expected, isn't it? Well, damn you, isn't it? Darling, there's no need. There's every need. Uh, oh, dear. Oh, dear, the well seems to have run dry. I'll ring through. Oh, well, the bar will be closed, but I, I'm sure if you were to try using your personal charms... <laughs> Please, Marianne. Very well, David. You, um, you know we're splitting up, Marianne and myself. Um, she, she told you we were? Yes, David, she told me. Yes, of course she did. But she probably told you it was her idea, not mine. A supreme personal sacrifice in the cause of art. Something like that. Not true. It was my idea. My decision. I see. Well, do you think I'd honestly swap a, a single moment of my life with Marianne for the existence I knew before? And for what now must take its place? I... I don't know. <laughs> well, take my word for it. But, David, you still have the choice. No, no choice. For Marianne's sake, you see, living with me is... It's just not... It's just not safe any longer. This... This force inside me is just not safe. Why don't you try telling me about it? Well, there have been several occasions, incidents. I don't think I understand. It's quite simple. A desire to, to hurt, to, to inflict. At first, simply with a, with a gesture, a word, until... Go on, David, tell me. Until... In London, about a month ago, there'd been a reception after the concert. 
Marianne was tired and came back early to the hotel. I remember getting back myself in the early hours of the morning. I went into the bedroom. I watched her sleeping there. And then, suddenly, my hands... God! My hands... about her throat. Possessed. With a will, a volition, all of their own, pressing harder, harder, until... until, just as suddenly, it stopped. No hate anymore. Only remorse. Remorse and the decision that it should never happen again, ever again. But it's still there, you see. In the hands... A force over which there can be no control. And the alternative, if you choose not to accept it, not to release it? Pain, certainly. And perhaps, ultimately, a hell beyond anything man has ever known. As the soul fights the body to get free and the, and the body fights back to imprison it. The pain of tearing as the soul tries to get out. For what seemed an eternal moment, my friend studied the frail eloquence of his hands holding the tumbler. Then, with an inner force that seemed totally their own, they jerked convulsively. <coughs> the crystal tumbler lay in a thousand razor-edged splinters at his feet. That, as it turned out, was to be my last meeting with David. And the next day I flew on to Rome. But I did hear from Marianne. we just finished some location sequences at a small fishing village when her letter arrived. There'd been a long delay in its forwarding. The postmark, Paris... A good month earlier. I opened it with an almost positive conviction of what I would find. I know what a shock this will be to you. David collapsed as soon as we got back to the hotel that night. By the time we got him to the hospital, there was nothing to be done. I knew you were leaving for Italy the next day or would have been in touch before this. God knows I needed a friendly shoulder to cry on. You will see from one of the clippings the jury at the coroner's hearing recorded an open verdict. But I think we, anyway, know only too well there was a very real, if inexplicable, cause. Let it remain our secret. The price David paid for his unique talent was finally exacted in full, and in a manner so bizarre, I find it impossible to embark on here. But if the final awful proof should interest you, and you are returning via Paris, please ring me at this number, and I will arrange a meeting with Dr. Emile Fouchard. I have already told him he may expect to hear from us, and that he is to hold nothing, I repeat, nothing, back. We owe you this. Besides, to know is to share. Marianne. To know is to share. But to know what? To share what? What was it that eventually persuaded me to do exactly as Marianne asked? To ring her number, arrange an appointment and finally find myself seated in the good doctor's surgery come consulting room, just off the Rue Madeleine. To hold nothing back. It's easily said, monsieur. But where does the knowing end and the disbelief begin? I, uh... Vincent, you have the right to know. Well, the simple facts and findings related to my friend's death... But they might prove as good a starting point as any. The simple facts, eh? Eh bien, so be it. 
Here it is. <clears throat> As presented in testimony at the coroner's court, for which there is allowed no room for speculation or error. A summary of these facts, then. Several witnesses of your friend's collapse in the foyer of his hotel, his admission to the Hôpital de la Vierge on the Ile de la Cité, the inescapable fact that he was pronounced dead on arrival, the admitting physician diagnosed heart failure, brought about by blood clotting, brought about by an excessive consumption of alcohol. I, uh, I see. And so I thought, did I? I'm, I'm sorry? I suspect that Madame omitted to inform you that during his stay in Paris, I acted as her late husband's physician. No, it's true. I finally managed to persuade David he might benefit from, well, from some kind of treatment. Though I must impress that without Madame's express instructions, I would not dream of discussing it with you now. I appreciate that. So be it. My initial examination of the patient was thorough and exhaustive. I gave it as my considered opinion that the root cause of Monsieur Clemente's malady was mental rather than physical, which is why I used all my influence to be allowed to assist at the post-mortem. Vindication, vanity, call it what you will. Eventually it was achieved. With Marianne Clementis's consent. Well, what possible reason could I have for not giving it? If anything, I think Madame appreciated more than anyone the professional predicament I suddenly found myself in. Have you uh, ever witnessed a post-mortem, monsieur? Oh, <laughs> no, no. Then, if you are not of an over-squeamish disposition, I shall attempt to enlighten you. Uh, to begin with, then, to the casual observer, it is more an object lesson in butchery than surgery, rather the slaughterhouse than the operating theatre. The instruments we employ, for the most part anyway, uh, might be purchased in any cancaillerie, a uh, hardware shop, you know. The ultimate object of the exercise is to arrive at the vital organs, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the stomach and its contents, uh, with the maximum of efficiency and the minimum of subtlety. Yes, I understand. Uh, to this end, then, a uh, hacksaw and cold chisel for the removal of the cranium cap, <coughs> the ribs and the sternum, a scoop for the removal of the brain, a butcher's knife for passing out the heart sac, the stomach and lung cavities. Uh, oh. Some fresh air, perhaps. Thank you. A butcher's trade. So much offal to be removed, examined, disposed of, and then replaced with sufficient stuffing material as will persuade the bereaved relatives that their dear departed is as complete and unsolid as when he first came into our charge. And uh, as a result of this butchery... Uh, we found nothing. Positively nothing that in any way affected my original opinion that the person I'd examined in this office not so many days before was as fit as any one of his age, constitution and occupation could be expected to be. Hello. Cause of death, inconclusive. Consequence? An open verdict. And duly recorded for anyone to read. Well, then what's the mystery? Occurrences. Yes. Let us, let us call them occurrences. The nature and reason for which we can only speculate. Go on. The cadaver of your late friend was placed in one of the wall cabinets with which every dissecting room is equipped. A kind of uh, container, you understand, large enough to accommodate a corpse, but otherwise similar to the kind of filing cabinet you'd find among any office furnishing. Ah, uh, yes, I understand. I felt sure you would. Well, and then? The cabinet was locked. Locked? Is that customary? Uh, as I explained at the time to Madame, reserved mainly for celebrities, mm. in view of the current excessive curiosity of the popular press. Just a precaution, you understand. Yes. On the very next day, a complaint from Monsieur Corbeau, the artist, was delivered by hand. The very next day. Corbeau? But where does Corbeau come well, in? David had long ago agreed that Corbeau should one day be allowed to make a cast of his hands. Oh. But it was a long-standing, well, a life-standing agreement. 
When he read of David's death, he asked if I now had any reason to refuse that request. And? Well, no reason. In fact, it gave me a kind of comfort, a memento for posterity. Doctor, you said... Corbo made a complaint. Yes. Within hours of the remains being put at his disposal. I still have his letter, Vincent. Well, perhaps you'd like to read it for yourself. Macabre. Grotesque. Satanic. Defilement. But what does he mean? In that too, you must judge for yourself. But first, I must trust that at no time not right up until the locking of the cabinet, had we dissected or performed any pathological examination on the hands of the deceased. We had no reason to. They, well, they would have told us nothing. Some uh, photographs. These taken before the cabinet was yes. locked. Yes, I see. Palm to palm. Total repose. And these taken immediately after the complaint of Monsieur Cobo had been received. To know is to share, Vincent. You'd never have recognized them for hands. They'd been severed. No, they'd been torn away from the rest of the limb. Each joint cracked, the flesh bloated and pistulated, as though all the time, during the hell-like ritual of that post-mortem, as the surgeon butchers went about their casual ritual of carving, hacking, and scooping, the living soul captured within was screaming for escape. A living hell. To lie on a marble slab, eyes expressionless, unblinking, tongue mute, grotesquely protruding through the cavern of the larynx, simply lying there, knowing it, experiencing it, waiting only for the tortures of the hell to stop, for the chance, finally, to break free, and for the soul music to begin. To know is to share. I made my way back to the hotel. It was raining. At a corner, a street musician sawed forlornly away on his violin. He seemed surprised at the charity I dropped into his cap. But there was no joy in the tune he played. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in soul music was Coral Brown, with John Graham, Roger Snowden and Michael Burnington. Soul music was first recounted and dramatised by William Ingram and produced by John Dyer.